Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is my quarantine hair. And I would like to welcome you to the summer 2020 offering of EC3084 signals and systems. And today we're going to be taking Laplace transforms of impulse functions. Let's take the Laplace transform of a delta function that is sitting at t naught. Whenever I say the term Laplace transform, I mean the one-sided Laplace transform. And you'll find that to be generally true out in the wild. Most of the time, if somebody just says Laplace transform, they mean the one-sided version unless they say otherwise. So we're plugging in delta t minus t naught for what we usually call x. We're integrating against the kernel e to the minus st over time. Because it's one-sided, we're starting at zero. And the minus here indicates that I want to make sure to include any singularities at the time origin in that interval. If you wanted to try to make this a little bit more formal, you could write it something like this. You could say it's the limit as e approaches zero from below or something like that. Anyway, we can use the same tricks that we've used all semester. We know that this delta function only turns on at t naught, so I can substitute t naught in for t. That's the only place where it matters. That e to the minus s t naught is not a function with respect to time t, so it pulls out in front. And then what am I left with? Well, I'll be left with this delta function integrated over its range, which will just give me 1. So we're done, and we have a new Laplace transform pair. A delta function sitting at t naught transforms into this exponential function in the Laplace domain. Now, this does look a lot like a Fourier transform pair. If you plug in j omega for s, this looks exactly like the Fourier transform pair we derived in a previous lecture. I do want to emphasize that this trick of plugging in j omega for s doesn't always work. There's another caveat that we didn't need in the Fourier transform case, which is this is really for t naught bigger than or equal to zero, because if you had t naught that was less than zero, that would put your impulse function on the left-hand side of the axis here, and our one-sided Laplace transforms wouldn't really know how to properly deal with that. So an obvious and important special case would be to let t naught equal zero. That would give us the pair delta t sitting at the origin. Laplace transforms into just a constant one, which you would get for plugging in zero for t naught. And yes, that is exactly the same kind of pair we had with Fourier transforms. Okay, so now that we've gotten a few Laplace transform pairs under our belt, let's look at our first Laplace transform property. Suppose we have a signal x of t, and we know it's Laplace transform big X of s. And suppose we wanted to use this to find out what the Laplace transform of a shifted version of the function was. We looked at a similar property for Fourier transforms, and we're going to prove it here the same way. We'll take the Laplace transform of x t minus t naught and do some variable substitutions. So I'll write tau is equal to t minus t naught, then t is equal to tau plus t naught, then I'll have the differentials dt d tau. All right, so if I plug all of that into here, I'll have x tau, and then I'll have e to the minus s tau plus t naught. This looks just like it did in the case of the Fourier transforms. I'll now integrate against the tau variable. e to the minus s t naught is constant with respect to tau, so I can pull it out in front of the integral and write e to the minus s t naught. And what else am I left with? Well, I'm left with this integral of now x of tau, e to the minus s tau d tau. And if you've been paying close attention, you'll see I've put off thinking about what's happening at the limits here. Previously, I was always adding or subtracting from either infinity or minus infinity in the Fourier transform lectures. Here, I do have to worry about what's happening at the lower limit. Okay, so if I have this lower limit at zero for the t axis, now that I'm on the tau axis, I would plug in zero here and find out that my lower limit needs to be changed to minus t naught. The upper limit can still stay at infinity. 
Now I'm going to put in another bit of a caveat here. Let's assume that x of t is zero for t less than zero. What that means is I could take this lower limit here and actually change it to a zero minus because assuming that I'm shifting things to the right here, we'll come back to that question. What I want to avoid is the problem of having some stuff over here on the left that normally is getting chopped off by the one-sided Laplace transform that is suddenly being introduced into the range of this one-sided Laplace transform once I've shifted everything over. But once I've made that particular substitution, we can observe that this whole thing is just the one-sided Laplace transform of our little x. So in the Laplace domain, this shift just corresponds to multiplying our Laplace transform by e to the minus s t naught. And just like with the pair we just looked at for the properties, if I were to substitute a j omega in here for s, it would look like the property that we derived for Fourier transforms, but I have to yet again emphasize this trick of plugging in j omega for s doesn't always work. So now we've built up the first of what is going to be a series of Fourier transform properties. Now suppose for a second that I had previously just proved this special case and that I had not proved this more general case with this general t naught. We could prove this more general case by simply applying our shift property to this specific case. We know that shifting the delta function here by t naught corresponds to multiplying by e to the minus s t naught. And well, what would that mean for our Fourier transform down here? The Fourier transform of the delta function at the origin would just be 1, and 1 times e to the minus st naught gives us e to the minus st naught. So that's just a consistency check. There's another Laplace transform property that I'm not going to prove here, but we will use a lot, which says that if you take two functions in the time domain and convolve them, that corresponds to multiplying their Laplace transforms. This should not be surprising. This looks exactly like a similar property we had for the Fourier transform situation. I should mention as a caveat that all of the pairs that we're looking at and all the properties we're deriving, these all have region of convergence issues that are hiding in the background. But as long as we're dealing with one-sided Laplace transforms, we don't really need to worry about them. So we'll generally not discuss those unless I absolutely have to. If we were doing a MIT 6003 style version of this course with bilateral Laplace transforms, then we would have to explicitly talk about regions of convergence with all of these pairs and properties. I'm mentioning it here because it gives us another route of proving this shift property. We could write x of t minus t naught as x of t convolved with delta t minus t naught and I think we did a similar derivation in a lecture about the time delay property for Fourier transforms. Anyway, this isn't very surprising. X of t transforms into the big X of s. This delta function here transforms into this e minus s t naught. And if we substitute that in for h here, well, that gives us the expression up here. Again, this is another consistency check. So let's do another example using this property. In the last lecture, we formulated the transform pair e to the minus a t u t Laplace transformed into 1 over s plus a. Back with Fourier transforms, we had restrictions on a. Here we're in Laplace land, so we can go wild. If I let a equal 0, then that gives me an important special case of u t transforming into 1 over s. This is one of those cases where we can do something in Laplace land that we can't do in Fourier land. So how about our example? Suppose we wanted to take the Laplace transform of a boxcar function that starts at 0 and ends at 6. So I'm writing it here in a mathy way, but you could also, if you're feeling rebellious, draw something like this. Let's just put the chart right in here. It's a boxcar going from 0 to 6 of height 1. This is somehow the deeper, more fundamental truth. But if you're doing things with Laplace transforms, you really want to turn them into mathy type of things. So by linearity, we can take the Laplace transform of 
u of t and subtract the Laplace transform of u of t minus 6. Okay, so the Laplace transform of u of t is this 1 over s, and the Laplace transform of the unit step shifted to the right by 6. Well, I need to take it and multiply it by e to the s minus 6. And the way you will usually see this written is as having a 1 over s sitting out in front and a 1 minus e to the minus 6 s. And one thing I like about this example in particular is it emphasizes how different treating this kind of little boxcar is when you're thinking about it in the Laplace domain versus the Fourier domain. So we have taught you to think about using linearity a lot. So supposing that you wanted to take the Fourier transform of this happy boxcar function, you would be tempted to take the same approach that we did above, to take the Fourier transform of u of t and subtract from it the Fourier transform of u of t minus 6. But this would be a very dangerous path. It's technically possible, but I strongly recommend not thinking about it this way. And I know that's tricky because we've really emphasized using superposition to break things down into individual blocks and treat each of those individual blocks. This is a case where you're much better off using the various Fourier transform properties we already computed about boxcars, in particular sync functions. So the best way to think about this would be to think about it as a sync function. Boxcar with length here, it would be L equals 6 omega over 2, all over omega over 2. This sync function on its own, that would be the Fourier transform of a boxcar centered at 0, which isn't something one of these one-sided Laplace transforms would be dealing with anyway. And you would need to shift it over by 3. So here you would write e to the minus 3j omega. And let's see, to simplify this out, I would just turn the 6 over 2 into a 3, you could leave the 2 down in the denominator of the denominator, or you could put it up top. I'm going to leave it where it is. And you could take this formula here, plug j omega into it, pull out one of these e to the minus 3 j omega kind of looking terms, and then use Euler's formula on what remains to compute this. But you could really only do that for this little special case of plugging in s equals j omega that corresponds to taking your s-plane, so we're plotting the real part of s on the horizontal axis and the imaginary part of s on the vertical axis, and evaluating it here along the imaginary axis, that j omega axis. You could do all of those various transformations to go from here to here, but only in that particular s equals j omega case. For the arbitrary s within the regions of convergence that we're looking at here, there's not really any way to simplify this expression further that's any more illuminating than just writing this as you see it here. So this is a place where Fourier transform thinking versus Laplace transform thinking have very different flavors. So there is a slightly sticky issue that can come up in practice. And for this, let's think about an example using our classic decaying exponential. Suppose I wanted to find the Laplace transform of a function e to the minus 3 t minus 2, u of t minus 2. So what is the Laplace transform of that? Well, we already know what the Laplace transform of an instant on at 0 exponential is. If a is real and bigger than zero, this could be decaying, but it could also be expanding or it could be a complex sinusoid. All I really need to do here is to write the base transform pair, which here would be s plus 3, and then I'll multiply it by e to the minus 2s to facilitate that shift to the right. The original function might look a little something like this. It starts at 2, it's going to have a height of 1 at that point, and then it's going to decay. Well, what if I want to shift it some more? I could certainly shift it to the right. And in fact, you will often see this property called something like the time delay property with some sort of caveat here that t naught needs to be bigger than equal to zero with t naught here being the amount of the shift. But if you think back to Fourier transforms, t naught could be anything. You could have a t naught that was less than zero and that was fine. That would move the function to the left. And you can, in fact, still do that here. 
if you've got enough space here that you can shift things to the left without having bits of the function being chopped off at zero by that part of the Laplace transform integral that has this zero chop at the lower limit. So here you could say we have this Laplace transform of this function and then say, oh, in the Laplace transform domain, what would it mean to shift it to the left by one? Well, I could write e to the plus s, and that would be fine. That would move this thing to the left. The resulting time domain function, let's say I took an inverse Laplace transform. I hate this notation of using a superscript minus one to indicate inverses. In the history of math, it should have just been reserved to represent reciprocals, but it's a common notation and we're kind of stuck with it. What does this look like? Well, this would now look like the same decaying exponential, just starting at one. And you could push this all the way up to two. What you could not do is something like e to the plus 3s with this function, because that situation would take this and try to shift it all the way back to minus one here, but then we would wind up with a problem here where the function gets chopped off at zero. So yes, you can use this shift with negative shifts that move to the left, but you really need to make sure that you're in this zone where any part of the function that you're shifting left doesn't get chopped off at that zero point, because then the math isn't going to work out for you anymore.